please help us in welcoming to the podium Amy Louise Wood. Um, thank you, Charles, um, and thank you all for, for being here. Uh, the last time I was at the Lillian Smith Book Awards, I was, uh, as Charles mentioned, I was an intern for the Southern Regional Council, and I was helping to set up. So I never expected to be on this side of the, of the podium. Um, the um, Southern Regional Council was the successor organization to the uh, Commission on Interracial Cooperation, which from its founding in Atlanta in 1919 devoted much of its energies towards fighting lynching and fighting mob violence. And of course, Lillian Smith is a hero to anybody who works on the history of, of racism in America. Um, so you can imagine to be receiving this award is, is a tremendous honor for me. So I want to thank the, uh, the, the panel of jurors. I want to thank the sponsors of this award, the Southern Regional Council, the Georgia Center for the Book, and the University of Georgia Libraries. Um, I also have some personal thanks for a couple of people. It's great to see old friends in the audience today, um, but there's a couple people I want to mention. One is Matthew Bernstein, who was a mentor to me at Emory University, who's just showed tremendous encouragement and support for this project, um, and pretty much taught me everything I know about film studies. Um, and Jennifer Mears, my dear friend, um, who has not just been an amazing friend, but went beyond the call of duty um, and did a lot of editing uh, for this book. She's an incredible editor, and if anyone needs an editor, go talk to Jennifer. Um, it's a strange and horrible thing to, um, to make unimaginable acts of violence the center of one's research and therefore the center of one's life. Um, I understand that it can't be easy for readers either, so I'm very, uh, I'm deeply appreciative of those readers who chose to um, immerse themselves in this topic along with me. And again, uh, part of the honor of this award is knowing that. Um, I thought I would use my time to talk about some of the objectives that I had in doing this project uh, and some of the themes and talk about some of the themes that I cover in the book. Um, this book project began, I guess, over 15 years ago now. Um, I was a graduate student, a master's student at the University of Mississippi, uh, where I knew Charles Eagles and his wife. Um, and I was working um, as a research assistant for a documentary on violence for Alabama Public Television. Uh, it, the documentary never got funded and never got made, but one of my tasks as a research assistant was to find images to go along with this documentary. And I was sent to Atlanta, Georgia, and um, I found myself at the Georgia Archives looking at the Vanishing Georgia collection, where I came across these photographs of lynching that astounded me. Many of you might know the collection of lynching photographs that came out in the book Without Sanctuary and that were exhibited at the MLK Center about seven to eight years ago. And if you have seen those photographs, then you know how horrific and powerful that they are. Um, those photographs hadn't resurfaced yet. That collection uh, wasn't known yet when I was uh, first embarking on this project. Um, so when I came across these photographs in the Georgia Archives, they were shocking to me. I knew that this violence had taken, a, had taken place and I knew it was horrible, um, but that people would choose to photograph um, the violence puzzled me. Um, what did it mean to phot photograph an event like this? What does it say about the act of lynching that people did photograph it? So when I entered my doctoral program at Emory University, um, understanding this puzzle became the center of my research. And then that interest in photography came to spread to other aspects of the visual, um, not just photographs, but the performance of lynching and uh, motion pictures. So my interest then focused on the visual aspects of lynching, the spectacle of it. Uh, which meant that I tended to focus on the most gruesome kinds of lynchings. One, uh, the lynchings that drew hundreds, if not thousands, of, of spectators, the ritualistic tortures, uh, the photographs, um, uh, the films of lynching. 
to be sure, many of the over 3,000 lynchings that happened in the South were not these massive spectacles. Uh, even though I think even smaller, or what I found was smaller, more private lynchings often tended to be ritualistic and tended to have photographs produced of them. Um, but it was the extremes of violence, the spectacle of it, the level of sadism that people could engage in um, that, that interested me most. And in focusing on the ex extremes, my intention was not to sensationalize the already sensational. Um, it was to understand it in some way, not to excuse it or to explain it away, but to understand it. Um, I don't think that these forms of violence are senseless or beyond comprehension. Instead, I see them as extraordinary expressions of ordinary sentiment. Human cruelty warrants explanation. How are ordinary people brought to extreme levels of violence? And that's uh, important to recognize, that these were otherwise ordinary people and otherwise law-abiding citizens, um, churchgoers, fathers and mothers, working men. And so in my book, I try to explain how it came to be that these ordinary people participated in, um, in this in this violence, or at least watched it or celebrated it, how their cruelty became socially acceptable. Historians of this violence have tended to look at lynching after the Civil War in political or economic terms, um, that it was a means of terrorizing African Americans and bolstering white power when the possibility uh, or when black enfranchisement and black economic advancement were seem like real possibilities after the Civil War. So then lynching operated alongside systematic disenfranchisement um, and segregation to maintain white supremacy, to keep African Americans, quote, in their place in the absence of slavery. But I see this violence as, as more than just a political act. It was also a cultural act that conveyed meaning to its participants and to its witnesses. So I seek to explain why the violence was committed the way that it was, why the tortures, why the rituals, why the photographs, what meaning did these practices have for participants, and what did they convey. Um, and to do so, I look at how they overlapped and drew from other forms of spectacle and spectatorship at the turn of the century uh, in this Jim Crow period. Um, so I have, as Charles mentioned, I have chapters on the relationship between lynching and public executions or the relationship between lynching and religious tradition. Uh, lynching shared ritualistic aspects of religious practices. I also look into more depth at the uses of lynching photographs, uh, how they overlapped with conventions of photography that that, uh, that Americans would have been familiar with at the time, and the representation of lynching in motion pictures in, for instance, a film like um, Birth of a Nation, the infamous 1915 film, which you're probably very familiar with. Um, lynching seeped into many aspects of American popular culture and popular consciousness, not just in the South, but in the country. My book is subtitled witnessing racial violence in America, because although most lynchings in the Jim Crow era took place in the South, the spectacle of lynching was not confined to the South, it was a national practice. We also tend to think of this violence as um, archaic or primitive, as somehow pre-modern. And that's how uh, liberals at the time viewed it. It's certainly how Lillian Smith viewed it. Um, they saw it as a symptom of backwardness, a sign that lynch mobs were out of step with the ideals of American democracy, but also the ideals of modern civilization. Once the South more fully modernized, the idea was, once its people became uh, more educated or their, the criminal justice system became uh, more centralized, lynching would decline. More recently, though, historians have tended to look at the ways that lynching itself was, rather than pre-modern, was modern, at least in the ways that mobs made use of modern technologies, and that lynching as a practice was supported through modern media. My book looks at lynching um, in relationship to modernization in the South. That, uh, 
process of transformation after the Civil War with the um, growth of, of towns and cities, with the rise of industry, with growing commercialism in the South. But I understand lynching as reactionary against that process of transformation. White Southerners feared that uh, urbanization and commercialism were leading to more crime, that it was leading to a decline uh, of traditional moral values and, of course, the traditional racial order. Um, lynch mobs made use of modern technologies, but that did not necessarily make the practice a modern one. And in fact, as lynching spectacles became more commercialized, circulating nationwide in print media and in film, that is, um, as they became more a part of modern America, they served to mobilize the anti-lynching movement and hasten the decline of lynching. Lynching spectacles eventually came to be used in the service of, of anti-lynching activism. And I have chapters at how activists were able to use the sensationalistic qualities of photography and cinema to publicize the atrocity of lynching as this barbaric and, and backward uh, practice. Uh, I noted um, that it was important for me to understand the experience of the perpetrators of the violence, but I also wanted to stay attuned to the experiences of its victims and the most appalled observers of this violence. So I tried to find as much as I could about the victims of particular lynchings that I was uh, going into more depth, that I was studying um, in my research, often unsuccessfully. Um, but in lieu of that, I also tried to pay attention to the ways in which African Americans um, resisted and responded to this violence. So through the 1920s and 1930s, white Southerners increasingly found their own racial claims that they were more civilized and they were morally superior to African Americans. They found those claims under scrutiny and attack. You know, how can you be engaged in these kinds of barbaric kinds of rituals and call yourself more civilized? Um, to the point that lynching became a regional embarrassment for them. And this was certainly the stance of Southern groups like the Commission uh, for Interracial Cooperation. Um, so in some sense, liberal observers at the time were right that modernizing the South, or at least insisting that the South conform to national standards, contributed to a shift in the practice of lynching. Um, and I should note that even though most uh, white Americans by the 1930s came to find the spectacle of lynching to be unacceptable, uh, they still, uh, that didn't mean that they, they abandoned their support for white supremacy or their support for uh, racial segregation. It's at that point, though, that lynching went from being this hyper-visible practice to being a largely invisible one. It didn't disappear. It went underground, and it took new forms. So my book attempts to understand not only why lynching was so visible at the turn of the century, but how it became invisible. Um, and we can question what damage that invisibility has done. In the recent past, I think, many white Americans have been largely ignorant of lynching's history. I've had a number of people tell me that they had no idea it was that pervasive or they had no idea it was that gruesome. And that was certainly my understanding uh, before I embarked on this project. Um, so the more recent invisibility of lynching, the decline of this particular form of racial violence has also obscured the memory of this violence. It's allowed white Americans to forget, and it's rendered the victims of this violence invisible. And I hope that this book has helped to remedy that. Thank you again for listening, and thank you for your